Tonight on Greater Boston, it's a family affair as President Biden's special envoy for climate, John Curry and Dr. Vanessa Curry, both join me from the UN climate conference known as COP26 in Glasgow, Scotland. We're spending the whole show with them, talking about what world leaders have accomplished, what they haven't, and what's next in the fight to mitigate the worst effects of climate change that threaten us all in more ways than most of us even know. As leaders from around the world gathered at the COP26 climate talks, President Joe Biden issued this apology. I do apologize for the fact the United States, uh, the last administration, pulled out of the Paris Accords and put us sort of behind the eight ball. More than a little bit, as that move shook global faith in the U.S. to meaningfully act on the issue. One recently released report was declared a, quote, code red for humanity, warning of existential natural disasters with heat waves, hurricanes, wildfires already worsening around the world, and the growing threat of rising sea levels, which is on track to put the world's coastal communities, including much of this state, underwater. And while the wealthy are causing the majority of the problems, the poor are bearing the brunt of them. A study in the journal Nature this week found fossil fuel burning by the richest nations is responsible for roughly 2 million deaths each year, mostly in developing countries. Since taking office, Biden has tried to undo much of the damage done by the climate change denier who preceded him and has put climate action at the heart of his agenda, including billions of dollars of clean energy proposals in his Build Back Better, although West Virginia coal investor Senator Joe Manchin is hard at work trying to limit its scope. Thankfully, no one let Manchin tag along to Glasgow, where the U.S. led a group of 90 governments in pledging to reduce methane emissions by 2030. They also joined another agreement to end deforestation by the same deadline, which was signed by more than 100 countries, including the U.K., China, Russia, and Brazil. I think we got a lot done. But as my next guests know well, it's not done until it's really done. Former Secretary of State and Massachusetts Senator John Kerry is now the nation's first ever special presidential envoy for climate and is a leader of the COP26 talks. He also helped steer negotiations on that historic Paris climate accord that Trump later blew up, an agreement he personally signed back in 2016. Look at that, with his then two-year-old granddaughter in his lap. He joins me now from Glasgow, as does Dr. Vanessa Curry, who spoke about the health implications of climate change at the summit. She's director of the Global Public Policy and Social Change Program at Harvard Medical School, a physician at Mass General, and CEO of the nonprofit Seed Global Health. Secretary Curry, Dr. Curry, thank you so much for being here. Great to be with you. Secretary, if I can start with you, you called COP26 the last best hope for the world to get its act together. Did it? Well, we're not finished. We have 10 more days, I think it is. Uh, this is a marathon here in Glasgow. But we're making actually remarkable progress, uh, Jim. I just saw a analysis today put out by Fatih Birol of the International Energy Agency, and they have crunched the numbers on all the NDCs that have been submitted to date. And they came out with a figure of, if they're all followed through on and executed, implemented 1.8 degrees. I mean, I, I was flabbergasted when I saw that. And we have the largest increase in effort by the private sector with trillions of dollars available, ready to be deployed in order to invest in the transition. And um, the key is going to be working out now with the multi-development banks and others, how we create the blended finance and the risk assumption necessary to deploy it. But all in all, countries are at the table that have ignored this for some time. We have an incredible commitment. About 65% of global GDP is now working on adopted plans to be able to keep 1.5 degrees alive. I'll tell you, six months ago, I wouldn't have believed that that was possible, but it's happening. And when we have more to come in the next uh, days. But, Secretary, that table you're talking about, one entity that is not at the table is the worst polluter in the world, China. President Xi is not there. How does that not leave a huge hole in whatever you achieve in Scotland? Well, it's not accurate to say they're not at the table. Uh, President Xi himself elected not to come, but his team is here. The man that I've been negotiating with for 26 or seven sessions since January. 
with two trips to China. He is here. And we just finished a, a session just now working to see if we can find common ground. So this isn't over till it's over as you opened up with. And the fact is that uh, China does have a plan. They have submitted their plan. Many of us feel the plan could be stronger. That's a different argument, but uh, they are, they have submitted a plan. So, uh, you know, there's a lot more we can do together. We're working with China to try to figure out if that's something we could put on paper and actually make happen. Uh, but I'm encouraged that other countries who historically have not been that engaged, Mexico, uh, President Lopez Obrador, I went down there the other day. We, we spent the day together. He agreed that they would now move to deploy renewables. Uh, in addition, uh, other countries like South Africa, South Africa's put in a plan. They're prepared to get off of coal. They need finance and technology, but if we all will provide it, South Africa can move forward. Uh, Brazil has actually put forward yeah. a number of uh, thoughts. People are deploying renewable energy, even, even Saudi Arabia. So people need to stop and step back and really look at the four corners of what's being discussed here. And I think they'd be quite encouraged. Are we where we need to be? No. Will there be a gap when we finish? Yes. But we hope that the next 10 years, which is what the scientists have told us we have to do the full implementation, can be, can, can, can be continually plugged into by many of these countries as new technologies come online and as we make progress. Dr. Curry, I want to play just a little of your speech at COP26 to the U at the UK government pavilion. It's been very frustrating because it has just come out that 115,000 healthcare workers have died in COVID. And so our ability to respond to climate change, to address the health issues, to reduce the vulnerabilities to those that are most vulnerable, they overlap perfectly with where the critical shortages of healthcare workers are highest. What kind of progress did you see on that front, if any? Well, unfortunately, health has not been significantly on the agenda here in COP. Um, in this particular, we're really, it's not necessarily seen as central to climate change. And yet the fundamental elements of health, food, water, sanitation, and shelter are all driven by climate change or are going to be threatened by climate change. And where those things are going to be felt most severely are in the less resource settings, the settings that are already very vulnerable from climate change. And there's expected to be an additional 250,000 deaths a year from extreme heat, drought, that doesn't even count malnutrition and that doesn't necessarily, but it does include the lung effects you might have and, and other things. And so it's really important that we start to think of these as, you know, it's, it's one problem in many ways with also, you know, similar solutions to share a story um, really from the front lines. You know, when we train healthcare workers to, to be able to deliver care and to be able to respond to these lung problems with climate change and they're out there and they're doing everything they can and they're employing their training and they're saving lives, and then the electricity goes out, it's very difficult to be able to continue care. So as we, as we start to think about our climate solutions and building sustainable energy sources, we can be linking that to clinics. We can be thinking about this as a holistic problem um, that leverages across multiple sectors. And so I'm very hopeful, actually, that we can continue to shine a light about how all these solutions come together um, and, and we can solve many things at once. Secretary, I want to follow up on what you said about if, if these countries follow through in their commitments. When we've talked about COP26 on our radio show uh, and talked about environmental issues, climate change in general, the most common uh, thing that comes up is uh, how do we trust these polluters, these worst polluting nations? How do we ensure with no enforceability mechanism that they honor their commitments so that we get to that goal, if we can get to that goal? How do you respond to them? Well, uh, Jim, it's a great question, a legitimate, but there is an answer to it. Um, there is not a formal uh, process by which a country is, quote, punished or, uh, you know, held accountable for the, partly because that would require a treaty, an international agreement. Sure. Um, and we have a lot of folks in our country who won't uh, support any kind of international agreement. So we have to find a way to go forward where really public accountability is what will matter here. Let me give you an example. Just the other day, 
uh, there was a front page story in the Washington Post with graphic, you know, with pictures of the satellite program we have called Copernicus, which yeah. traces and looks at every country every day. And it showed a major methane leak in Russia. And that's something we didn't have the ability to do previously. You know the old saying, you can run, but you can't hide. Well, literally today, countries on a daily basis, the supply chains of corporations, when people say we're gonna be net zero by 2050, you're gonna be able to zero in on any big corporation and actually trace out their entire supply chain. And as that information gets public through tweets and internet and emails and you know stories, there's, there's going to be accountability, let me tell you. Um, and, and I think that in addition, these meetings will continue. And countries always feel sensitive to the public opinion of these meetings. They don't want to come and be the black sheep or the, you know, the entity that's yeah. not getting the job done. Well, let me turn the trust question around, though, Secretary. I'm sure you're confronting but by this. By the way, it's not yeah. trust, Jim. We, it, nothing that we're doing is going to be based on, quote, trust. Well, what is it if it's, it's not trust? It's based on the promises that they make and showing that they're actually doing it. Okay, and well, if they're not... Go ahead. Let's turn the trust issue around. I'm sure you've confronted this, and my guess is the president has confronted this. Uh, we played a minute ago what he said, his apology, essentially, for his predecessor's behavior on this and the climate denying. But what do you say to a colleague around the country when they say, how can we trust that there won't be a Trump 2.0 when the president of the United States can't even convince his Democratic colleagues to vote I'll on these issues? Why. Another great question, totally appropriate. Here's the answer, I think, and I believe this, and I have talked with leaders all around the world about this. I don't believe any politician, no single person, next president, whoever that is, if it isn't Joe Biden, and, and you know, we're way away from elections, so we, we got another three years to be able to implement and move forward. But the fact is that no politician would be able to stop what the marketplace is now doing. Trillions of dollars have been uh, held out now to become part of this transition. Ford Motor Company, General Motors, they're gonna retool to the tune of hundreds yeah. of millions of dollars because they're gonna produce electric cars. And as of 2035, only electric cars. So no politician is gonna make them go back and undo electric cars or the whole network that's being created around the world with respect to power and electricity. So I, I think you see, I mean, just today we had an announcement here in Glasgow, which uh, on a program that we've put together called First Movers, companies that have stepped up to say, we're gonna tell people we're gonna buy 10% of green steel, 10% of all the steel we buy to make Volvo automobiles. This is the company. And Volvo said, it's gonna be green. Uh, DHL is there, Amazon. Amazon joined up and said, we're gonna make certain that we're living up to green standards in the shipping that we do. So as that happens, the innovations that people are currently engaged in are going to know that they have a marketplace to go to. And so money begins to move in that direction. That investment level in three years will be so powerful across the world that I'm telling you, no politician in any country would have the ability to reverse that. I hope the this, marketplace is moving. I hope the 70 million people who voted for a climate change denier are listening. <laughs> if I can return to you, doctor, I know you spent a lot of your life's work in vulnerable nations, and I know there's something called the Vulnerable Nations Forum uh, at COP26, where the 48 countries, the most at risk, warming the fastest while admitting the least uh, our meeting, I know you were at one of their meetings, Secretary. Here's what one of their leaders, the president of Ghana, had to say in his speech to COP26. We're naturally very disappointed by the failure of the wealthy nations to honor their commitments of making available $100 billion annually to the poorer countries to assist us in the fight against climate change. Those same nations are, however, insisting that we abandon the opportunity for rapid development of our economies. Doctor, as I said, you've spent much of your work in many of those countries. Dr. Curry, first, what's your reaction to what the president had to say? I think he's speaking a hard truth. 
We've made a lot of commitments. Um, we being the global north, I think about promises that we can fulfill. And I think the reality is, and we're seeing it play out pretty harshly right now in the vaccine equity debate, right? Yeah. It's not even a debate, yeah. it's just vaccine equity fact. You know, I work with the health workforce. We have it currently, there is such a deep sort of dichotomy between who gets sick and who dies and who accesses the vaccine in COVID, for example. Two in five healthcare workers in the world have been vaccinated and one in 10 in Sub-Saharan Africa. So those, and yet we have made promises and commitments of delivering drugs or delivering vaccines, but it's not fast enough. We are facing two of the largest existential crises that we could face as humanity right now. A global pandemic that you know affects us all, though again, it affects those who are less resourced far more and the health systems that are uh, less resourced far more and climate change, which is, you know, a, a, and both of these do not respect borders. They are globally felt. Mm. So for those countries that are the least emitters, but are the most vulnerable because they have the less resources to be able to mitigate and adapt. I do think we have to start to think of ourselves more as a global community. And I don't mean that from a kumbaya. I mean that from a very pragmatic standpoint of global economy, trade, manufacturing. The reality is health is fundamental to our economic growth, to our national security, to our well-being. There's lots of data now that backs that. You know, for every year life expectancy that we can increase, there's a 4% increase in GDP. The United States alone spends $820 billion a year mitigating the health effects of just microparticles and, and smog in the United States alone. That's all lost opportunity. But so for countries that are looking to join the economies of the world today, to have so much of their population at risk from either climate change or from health, it's an impossible thing to overcome without a major influx of resources and the ability to really bridge that gap. We can do that as a global community, that economy and resources exist. The resources exist, the science exists, the technology exists. The only thing that is missing is political will. So I, there is a truth there, um, but I also want to recognize that I think people are trying and, and the mood here in COP26 has been one, I think, of really shifting to try to meet this moment. Do we have to keep being aspirational? Yes, because we will fail as global citizens if we don't fundamentally close these gaps, but it's possible. But Secretary Curry, uh, it is true that I think it was a $100 billion commitment that wealthy nations made to these developing countries that I believe was supposed to be passed along in 2020 has not been honored, has it? Well, let me begin by, first of all, uh, recognizing Vanessa's analysis there, which I really agree with in terms of the inequity and, and the base here. But here's the but. President Obama committed to put $3 billion in to the collection that was heading towards the $100 billion. And uh, regrettably, Donald Trump came in and blocked the money for three years. And the United States did not live up to its agreement under President Trump. President Biden has come in, and he has now put on the table $11.4 billion uh, for the soonest moment that our budget process will allow us to achieve it. And, and this is very important, we've been working with other countries to bring them to the table to grow that amount of money. So in fact, the OECD, the Organization Economic Cooperation and Development, which, which analyzes this money, has said that for, the, that, that, that for next year, uh, we were at about 98 billion. And now, thanks to Japan contributing yesterday, we're able to leverage the World Bank to put in more. We're over 100 billion for next year. And we are absolutely over 100 billion for each of the years thereafter. So the United States is not only living up to that promise under President Biden, but President Biden put $9 billion on the table to deal with deforestation. And unless we deal with deforestation, we can't achieve the goals that we have. So for the Amazon and the Congo Basin, and for the Southeast Asian forests, we now have an ability to be able to move forward and deal with deforestation. So we're making tremendous progress here. And I know the president from Ghana, I talked to him just in the last couple of days. And I think people recognize that the 100 billion is on the table now. It's been achieved for next year and going forward. Secretary, and a lot more, and a lot more. Speaking of Trump and his colleagues, how much is the failure to act in Congress and not just 
universal Republican opposition, but the failure of your fellow Democrats to act on these climate provisions, not to mention the excise of arguably the most important provision, courtesy of uh, Senator Manchin. How much does that hurt your effort at COP26, Secretary? Well, let me be clear. Uh, would it be, you know, good to be able to come in and have certain things to be able to show? Yeah, yeah it would have been better, but it, does, it hasn't hurt us. It really hasn't hurt us because President Biden put so much on the table. He came here personally, he spent two days, meetings, and, and uh, taking part in various uh, events. And I think people here know what he's fighting for. And I believe uh, the president's gonna get this legislation through it. I don't know when the moment will be, uh, but I believe that Congress uh, will, uh, you know, pass this at some point in time and the president will get it and the world will see it. But the world knows that he's serious about moving on this. And we will have, we have about 10 cabinet secretaries who will be coming through working on energy, Jennifer Granholm, uh, agriculture, Tom Vilsack and so forth. And in addition, uh, we have members of Congress who will be coming. And I think they will sense the anticipation of the world for our action. So I'm confident we will be there. I think the president's leadership with the infrastructure bill and the reconciliation are absolutely critical. Um, and, um, my sense is we're going to make progress on that as well as the progress we're making here in Glasgow uh, without it. And, and believe me, nobody's raised it with me. Not one conversation has anybody said to me, oh, you guys can't do it. Look at what's going on. Hasn't happened. Uh, you know, but would it be helpful? You bet. It'd be wonderful to walk into a meeting and say, look at what we're doing and use it as leverage. Can we spend the last couple of minutes uh, talking about not attitudes in Scotland, but attitudes where you both live, about a mile or so from where I'm sitting. Uh, starting with you, Dr. Curry, is despite fires and droughts and floods, 70 plus million people last year voted for a proud climate denier. Do the American people as a whole get it as far as you're concerned? Um. You know, I think it's an interesting question, you know, and I'll just speak personally as a physician and my experience and in, in sort of caring for people who have very much come in from some of the effects of this. And, you know, and I think in the public policy realm too, yeah, I think that we have a system right now that allows people to live in bubbles of communities online and elsewhere where they can really shelter themselves with a certain amount of information. And so I think part of it is how we structurally exist in our world today. People don't have access to the information to understand how they are directly impacted by some of these um, experiences. And, you know, when you see somebody who comes in who has truly been affected suddenly and is actually you know, sick from some of these effects, be it fire, smoke, smog, asthma attacks among their children, and you start to educate, people have the opportunity to learn. So I think that until we can figure out how to get through the kind of misinformation pandemic we also face, it's very difficult to change minds and to make those connections. I think we can do a better job um, of, you know, as a community of trying to figure out how to make those very direct connections because, the health impacts of climate change are very real. And they, you know, and whether it's devastating tornadoes, increased number of extreme events, the rapid rise of heat, mm -hmm. um, the rising drought that's happening within our country, um, you know, it, it's, it's going to become very real for people progressively. And I think that we need to, we are gonna have to find strategies though, to be able to make those better connections. Cause there are a lot of people who don't see that connectivity in the right way but the information sources they get are not with you here now tonight, right? They're on Facebook among a small cluster of friends that they're sort of sequestered by. And the degree of misinformation is pretty profound. We combat it all the time. And it's incredibly difficult sometimes to get over because people trust the people they know, not people who they don't have a connection to. But I, you know, I'd love to hear my dad's perspective on this, who's been thinking about this in, in this piece of information political lens for, you know, a lot longer than I have. Well, let's end with that. How about, right. forget denialism amongst leaders. How about amongst your fellow Americans, Secretary Curry? Well, I think there's less denialism now, in fact, Jim. Uh, has it been a problem? Yeah, it's been a problem. It's why we're behind in, in, in the effort to deal with it. But 
uh, what's been happening, Mother Nature has been sending some pretty powerful messages to everybody. And the floods in the central part of the country, the farms that have been wiped out, the forests of California, uh, the, the, the extraordinary uh, water problem in the western part of the country around Nevada, Colorado, California, Arizona, uh, the heat, the level of heat, uh, the drought, uh, the mudslides. Uh, you add it all up, and I'm telling you, there are a hell of a lot more believers today than there ever were before, and the majority of our country absolutely wants us to deal with the climate crisis. It's a matter of responsibility, individual citizen responsibility and public responsibility. It's the responsible thing to do. And not only that, it will result in a cleaner, healthier, and safer United States and world. No question about it. I voted thousands of times as a United States Senator. Sometimes you agonized over what the impact and pluses and minuses were for you know, a, a tax code or for uh, individual citizens. And there's always that balance. This is a no brainer. This is not a hard choice. This is the easiest thing you can possibly choose to vote on because the health benefits as Vanessa has described are extraordinary. The particulates in the air from coal dust that go around the planet, drop into the ocean, acidify the ocean, changing the chemistry of the ocean faster than it's been changed in millions of years. I mean, the impacts of this the, are, are just stunning. You, you could have a complete collapse of agriculture in Africa, and then you'll have tens of millions of people knocking on the door to get into other countries. That's a security threat. That's why I say we'll be safer if we deal with this. Yeah. And every single analysis shows it is far, far more expensive if you wait and just suffer the damage than it is yeah. to invest in these new technologies, make this transition, create a clean energy future with all of the jobs that that will entail and the benefits that come with it. So I, I, I just think, uh, you know, we're gonna win this fight. It, it may take a few years here, but I guarantee you, we are gonna come out of Glasgow with a level of ambition that is gonna surprise people. And if we get about, and, and the businesses that are here, you know, uh, unbelievable. Google, Apple, uh, Amazon, uh, major shippers, Maersk is here. They've committed to buy a new round of ships that are carbon free. Mm -hmm. We've got, you know, unbelievable contributions being made. And I think it's gonna change the world. You know, you two have a lot of common interests. If your schedules permit, maybe you could spend some time together and talk. I think it'd be very, very productive. Secretary Kerry. I want you to know, Jim, Yes. I did not invite her to come to Glasgow. <laughs> she was invited all by her. I don't think it's we need to be told that. Fun moments where our worlds collide and it's, it's actually, it's been a blast, but. Um, Dr. Curry, Secretary Curry, I really appreciate your time and your work. Thank you so much for doing Thank it. Thank you. Bye, Thank yes. you. See you. Bye, Dad. <laughs>